Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, let's open them up. And uh, I do want to follow up on what Dan was saying that a lot of the purpose of the message tonight is really to talk to us as a movement. There's been a, a major shifting going on in the last two to three years. And I'm not sure that everybody is aware of it. And I want to just describe a little bit what's actually happening. And then ask, are we in agreement with this? Do we want to do this together? And I hope I'm ready to do this together. But, uh, so let's start anyway in Matthew chapter 6. Because we do want to bring the kingdom of God. We were talking about... Um, I've been doing a mini-series this week on kingdom alignment. For us to be aligned with the kingdom of God. We had a short time in our discussion group on, with the leaders on uh, Wednesday. And on Thursday night I talked about that we, have, we are to be faithful to our relationships. Not to worry about alignment, but if we're faithful to our relationships, then it, the alignment will just fall into place. And today I want to talk about uh, a different angle on kingdom alignment, which is us having a right attitude toward authority, or honoring authority, and if we do that, that will also swing us into the right place. And, and most of the message actually will be telling a little bit about the history of what's happened in the last two to three years, just to make everybody aware of what's happening, and then... The answer to this message, I just want to ask you, hey guys, are we in this? Do we want to do this together and make a decision to go on to the next stage of what God wants for us? But a little introduction about uh, something in the kingdom of God. Let's look at that. And that is uh, in Matthew chapter 6, um, such, perhaps the central phrase of all prayer, which represents the central desire in our hearts, for the kingdom of God. And how do we pray? Matthew chapter 6 verse 10. And it says, May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everybody prays this prayer. I wonder what they mean when they say that. Do we believe this? Let's look at this in the most simple terms. According to this verse, the kingdom of God has a, a place of origin. Where is that? Heaven. Heaven. And then it has a movement, a direction. Where is that? From heaven to earth. Now, earth is the destination. It has a place of origin and then a movement with a direction and then it has a place of destination. The destination of the kingdom of God is here on earth. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the kingdom of God. And very simply what we see here is a cooperation, a partnership between heaven and earth. It's not just heaven, it's not just earth. It's an amazing thing. Over most of the past 2,000 years, much of the Christian world has focused on the kingdom of God only heaven, and most of the Jewish world has focused on the kingdom of God on, only on earth. But it's neither of those, it's both of them together. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May your kingdom come from heaven to the earth. And when those two come into alignment, as it is in heaven, on earth, you've got the kingdom of God. Now, the only problem with this is that it says, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, when he says your will be done, he's not talking about the trees, folks. He's not talking about the birds, and he's not talking about the fish. He's talking about you and me, because we are the ones rebelling against the will of God. We're the ones that have to change our will. So God has a will, and we have a will, and our will is going in the wrong direction. And one of the two of us is going to have to change. <laughs> Which one is that? It's got to be us. And so when we 
change our will to be aligned with His will, then we have kingdom alignment and His kingdom comes. Now let's remember that God is all powerful. He doesn't need us to do the work. He just needs to get us to stop blocking the way. <laughs> just get lined up here. He's got all power and all blessing and all glory and every good thing for us. We just have to get lined up in the right place. He said, I'm trying to bring my blessing from heaven to earth to you right here. And you keep moving out of the spot. Come back over here and get lined up according to my will so that I can bless you. But there's something stubborn about our wills, isn't it? It seems like our wills just always want to do what it's not supposed to do. And we have to wrestle it back into place. It should be so easy. Or just to line up with the will of God. But we have to push ourselves, submit, get over, change, repent, whatever you want to call it. But we've got to get in line with His will. Now one of the things that's interesting about it is who starts this process? Remember that Yeshua said, I give you the keys of the kingdom of God through Peter. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So watch this. Although the direction comes from heaven to earth, the initiative goes from earth to heaven. Do you see the difference? The, the direction is, your will come from heaven to earth, but then he says, I've already got my will. So now you decide what you're going to do on earth. I'm waiting for you. You want to bind, you want to loose, do it. You want to get lined up, then you'll get lined up for the blessing. In fact, you're going to be lined up for the one way or the other. You're going to get lined up for the blessing or you're going to get lined up for the curse. You decide. But get yourself in the right place. It ought to be so simple. But it's just that we have this little problem with our will. Now, one of the things is, now, you know, I want to tell you something. I'm noticing I'm getting a little older. And I've been noticing that the young people, when they give uh, sermons... They've all got this high-powered, high-tech, audio-visual presentation <laughs> when they're going along. So I went to the store today and I prepared a, a high-tech, audio-visual presentation so that you can understand and get it along with the will of God here. So, uh, let's see, you know? see, this is really hard to understand this concept, isn't it? <laughs> Now, for those of you who are mothers, haven't all the mothers seen this? Yeah. Okay, help me get this off of here. So, um, haven't, haven't all mothers done this with their kids? I mean, there isn't a kid in the world that hasn't had this toy, right? And uh, I want the mothers to tell me, what age group does this go with? Preschool. Huh? Preschool. Preschool. I think it's preschool. Betty, what would you tell me? Age what? Six months? Personal 
too global. Are you listening? You gotta first get your self lined up with the will of God. And then it goes out from you to your family, to your congregation, to your nation, and then finally, if it's finally, it's supposed to get to the whole world. And we just have to be willing to get this thing lined up together. Now, if it was just people and we're all the same, you can't get any vertical alignment. You see what I'm saying? But God, He's above us. So God's alignment has a vertical alignment going up and down. Can you see that? It goes up and down. <laughs> Isn't that nice? That's not hard to understand, is it? <laughs> but that means in God there is a submission. He's over us. Yes. And that's the reason we don't want to get in line because we've got to submit yes. to Him. And we don't like that, do we? <laughs> we want to do it my way. <laughs> so a lot of this is about submitting to authority. Amen. And the problem is that all of us have a problem with authority. Now, if you read my book, you won't have any more problems with authority. <laughs> Let's take you a few hours. By the way, I've been noticing that Dan is giving some of his books away free, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pay you to read this book. You know what I'm saying? So we want to, we, we have to get in line with this, but we all have a problem with authority. At least you do anyway. <laughs> but we have, you know, we've all had situations where you were supposed to submit to authority and the person of authority was supposed to bless you and protect you and lead you and help you. What did he do? Hurt you. Yes, and then you got authority. I'm going to teach you a little Hebrew phrase. It says, when people get into authority in the first time, a sheton ole la rosh means your urine goes up to your head. <laughs> I don't know if that applies to anybody in this room. But you know what happens, you get a little bit of authority, all of a sudden you know everything. And everybody is there to serve you. No. That's not the purpose of authority. The purpose of authority in the Bible is to bless. It is to protect. It is to give life. But that's not what happens all the time, is it? And what happens in whatever direction we're in, we hurt one another. We hurt one another when we, we hurt the other people when we're in authority. And we rebel when we're supposed to be under authority. And we're all hurting everybody and we keep going and it's just all messed up. And to get that straightened out, we need a lot of healing. We need to find balance. We need to get healed from the past. Those of you who have done pastoral counseling, you know the embarrassingly high percentage of young women that have been sexually abused by fathers, by stepfathers, by uncles, by friends of their parents, but when they were 12 and 13 years old. What are you going to do? Go tell that young lady to submit to authority? It doesn't work. People need healing. We need to be set free. And we need to watch out how we're hurting people. And we need to under, we need to get this straightened out and get it in the right way so that we can come into the right alignment of authority. One of the things that I, I mentioned in this book, did you notice that in the Ten Commandments, it speaks of, um, of a relationship with parents twice. It says that the sins of the parents are visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. But then God says he passes his blessing on to a thousand generations. So you understand what God is trying to do. If you do it the right way, it will multiply a thousandfold. If you use it the wrong way, the whole thing is fighting against you doing it the wrong way, but it will still pass on. Now when God says he will visit the sins of the parents onto the children to the third and fourth generation, he does not mean, hello, that he's going to punish the children for the parents. That's not what he's saying. He's saying the sins of the parents influence the children. 
He's not saying, I'm going to punish the children for what your parents did wrong. He's saying, wake up, parents, that what you do will influence your children for good, and that will influence your grandchildren, that could influence your great-grandchildren. That what you do, because we are in relationship with you, it's not God punishing us for that, it's you passing on your stinky stuff to your children and your grandchildren. But if we get it right, then it will multiply a thousandfold. Now what does that mean? Nobody ever had perfect parents. So what it means is every single person in the world has got to look to his parents and say, the things that they did wrong, that want to influence me the wrong way, I have to stop that curse. I have to refuse to take it on. I have to recognize it as sin, call it as sin, and then forgive them of it and say, it will not go on. I will not take it on myself. I will not pass it on to my children. Are you listening? But then you look at your parents and you say, but what are the good qualities? And then I want to open my heart and stop rebelling and receive the good quality of your parents. There is no parent that was 100% bad and no parent that was 100% good. You maybe had one 99% bad or 99% but there, there's got to be something good and something bad there. Every person has got to do that. And, when, and, and I tell young people and I tell my children, before you get married, the most important thing is you've got to get healed of the relationship with your parents. Because you don't want to take your parents into the bedroom with you. Hello? <laughs> you want to break that stuff. You need to get healed of that relationship. Take the good things, get rid of the bad things, get healed, come into the right place, and then you can relate to your spouse, you can relate to other people, you can relate to your children, but you've got to get healed on this authority issue. Because it will either be used for blessing or for curse. Let me give you another example. You remember that the rich young ruler came to Yeshua and he said to him, what do I need to be saved? What a Messianic Jewish answer that Yeshua gave him. He said, listen, there's a two-part answer here. It depends what you're asking me. Are you asking me for what is the minimum you have to do not to be damned? Or are you asking me what do you need to do to be perfect and have eternal life now? And he said, it's two different things. He said, the minimum is this, just keep the commandments. And the perfection is, sell everything and come after me. Now that's what we want. But I want to tell you, God doesn't punish people don't get offended. He doesn't punish people for having wrong authority, for wrong theology. He punishes people for sinful activity. He punishes people for evil. And he doesn't punish people for not separating milk, meat and milk. That's not what it is. In fact, a man asked him, another good Jewish answer, well, which commandments? And what did Jesus do? He quoted from the Ten Commandments. In fact, he only quoted from five of them. Now listen to me. Jesus here established the fact that there are moral absolutes in the world. And in fact, he said it's so simple. It's not even the Ten Commandments. It's only five of them. There are only five moral absolutes in the world. There's only five things that will bring upon you punishment for damnation. And they have an order to them. And it goes like this. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. And then honor your parents. That's all there is to it. Now it doesn't matter if you're a Muslim, if you're a Christian, if you're a Jew, if you're an atheist, if you're a humanist, if you're a Hindu, those five things apply to you. You cannot kill, you cannot commit adultery, you cannot steal, you cannot lie, and you have to honor your parents. Are you listening to me? Yes. The problem with the people in, in, in ISIS, for instance, they are facing damnation from God. And it's not because they believe in Muhammad. It's because they're murdering people and raping them and plundering them and stealing people's money. That's what they're going to get punished for. Yes. And if you say you believe in Jesus and you're doing the same thing, you're going to get punished. That's what it's for. The judgment of God comes on people. It is a punishment for wrongdoing, for evil. Right. That's what you get punished for. And he said, if you, if you get that straight, then, he said, then you can come on. He said, 
to the money. What do you want to be like when you stop getting the wrong stuff? And what do you want to be? And this is, you can say, well, why do we need Yeshua then? Because, well, what do you want to be? He said, I came to transform you to be like me. And if you don't have him, who are you going to be like? And he, and he takes us and transforms us into him so that we can be children of God, live in glory, rule in the world to come, and all the other wonderful things in the plan of God. And the punishment comes on just for those five. Now it's obvious what I'm talking today, I want to talk about, what about that fifth one? I mean, I can understand. I know, don't kill, don't, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, but honor your parents? I mean, what, why is that so important there? You know, well, I guess if you haven't had any children yet, you don't understand why that's important. But when you have children, it's somewhere between the 100th diaper and the 200th diaper <laughs> that you have this revelation. You know, you're there and you're like, ah, you're not a wife And then you say, oh my God, I just realized something. What do you realize? My parents did this for me. <laughs> And what do you all do? You run to the phone, you call up your mom and dad and say, Mom and dad, I'm sorry! <laughs> For everything I've done wrong! <laughs> and you realize, wait a minute, somebody else took care of you. This is the most basic thing. Of, if you can't honor somebody that took care of you when you baby, what kind of... Yeah. Now you get to the new covenant and Paul takes that and he winds it. Ephesians 6 1, he says, he said, the honoring of your parents is that's the way, the first blessing in which you get the first command in which you get a positive blessing. But then he describes, but it's also concerning government leaders and work leaders and church leaders, and he expands it to a universal principle, which is when you honor authority, you receive blessing in every realm of your life. Amen. Or at least it's supposed to work that way. <laughs> And it isn't, it's all jumbled up because we, we're jumbling it up. But that's the way, that's the pattern of God for it to work. And when we honor authority, then blessing comes down upon us. And, that, and, and we're honoring upward toward God. And if you don't believe in God, you can't possibly honor authority. Because all you're looking is at that person there who you've got to submit to and is doing you dirt. And you think, why should I submit to anybody like that? It's only when you see God above that person yes. who's saying, I'm going to take care of this. Amen. Whether it doesn't matter what that person's doing, I'm going to make sure you get the blessing. You need faith to submit to authority. Without authority, without faith, you can't submit to authority. You'll just fight against it. And that's what all human beings, unless you see the grace of God above it all, you can't possibly do it. But that's what we want. We want to see the grace of God above this so that we can begin to get in the right line and receive the blessings of God's authority. The purpose of authority is to bless others, protect others, and to give them life. Now let's jump all the way now to over to the purpose of us as Jewish people. And I think Dan talked about this and I've heard Patty talk about it and Cheyenne talked about it a little bit. Genesis 12, 2 and 3. God took Abraham, basically the first believer, and he said, I will make you the father. You will be the parent, the spiritual parent of all the rest of the believers. And he said, I will enlarge you, I will make you great. And he said, and I will cause you to be a blessing. Yes. And then whoever blesses you will be blessed, whoever curses you will be cursed. And he said, so that, here's the purpose. So that through you, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. This is the destiny and the purpose of Israel. This is the destiny and the purpose of the children of Abraham is to bless the nations of the world. That's what we're called for. Not to keep Jewish tradition. The purpose that we have is to bless the nations of the world. And when you become a child of Abraham by faith, then God wants to use you to bless the nations of the world. And to, the only way we can bless the nations of the world is if we have faith in the greater son of Abraham, who is Yeshua, who has the blessing to give. And this is what we were called. You know, in, that God made within the people of Israel, in the Levite tribe, He made them priests, and they were to bless the people of Israel. 
And then he said to the people of Israel, I'll make the, although the Levites are one tribe of priests, but then he said, you as an entire nation, you will become mamlechet kohanim, you will become a kingdom of priests. Well, if the Levites are blessing the Israelites, who are the Israelites going to bless? If we're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, who's left there to bless? <laughs> All the nations of the world, right? And you can either be born into it or you can believe into it. Either way, you come into the place where you have a destiny to bless all of the rest of the people of the world. Isn't that great? And when you understand that, that your purpose in life is to bless others, then God is going to give you authority. Do you see that? Because the purpose of authority is to bless others. If you're not looking to bless others, if you're looking to get blessed yourself, then you're going to try to take authority. You got that? But when you want to bless other people, God wants to give you authority. We never take authority. Never. We only desire to bless others and then God gives us authority as a tool so that we can bless others. Is that making sense? Yes. And we want to bless all of the nations of the world. That's what we're here for. That's what Abraham was there for. There, you can't get any further back in Jewish identity than that. That's the first sentence. Is to bless the nations of the world. Oh, we Messianic Jews love that verse, don't we? Because <laughs> we want to bless the nations of the world. No, you stinking, <laughs> manipulated. We use that verse to go out and get offerings from the Gentiles. <laughs> hey, give us money and God will bless you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can laugh, but I watched 20, 30 years of Messianic Jews raising money on that verse. And totally missed the point. That verse is not about us milking the Gentiles for their money. It is about us making the decision to bless the nations of the world. And if we will make that decision to bless the nations of the world, God will give us authority. Now, do you, are you feeling Sensing an anointing of the Holy Spirit right here. God is saying this to us today. If we will today, if we will change our hearts and understand that the reason that we are here, Jew and Gentile, in this Messianic movement, in America, in Israel, around the world, in Jerusalem, if we will understand that why do we have this purpose is to bless the nations of the world, then God wants to give us an unheard of authority that has never been seen upon this planet. But we can't get that authority until we give up that thought and just want to bless the nations of the world. It's kind of a catch-22, you know? If we want the authority, we won't get it. But if we want, if we change our heart to love the nations of the world, then God will give us authority to be able to bless them. And here's the change of heart that God wants for us. For all of our congregations, it doesn't matter, MJA, Tikkun, UMJC, the Israel congregations, the Russian congregation, whatever it is. God wants us to change our hearts and say our purpose here is to bless the nations of the world. And God is waiting, would you please change your heart and understand that that's what you're here for is to bless the nations of the world. Because I want to give you a restored apostolic authority that will change the world and bring the kingdom of God. But I can't do it with you while your heart is still self-centered. You've got to get the understanding that we're here to bless the people of the world. And if we will desire to bless the nations of the world, then God will give us authority over the nations of the world in order to bless them. Was that clear? So that's our calling as a messianic movement is to bless the world. It's the calling of every believer. Now, here's not only that. Uh, Dan was speaking earlier today that, that we want to allow, we want na national groups to be different. We want them to maintain their, their identity and we want to bless them not only as individuals, listen closely, but we want to bless them as a nation. We, our calling is to help national groups come into their national destiny. The people of Indonesia have a national destiny. The people of Japan have a national destiny. The Germans have a national destiny. The Argentinians have a national destiny. And we want to help those nations come into their destiny. Amen. Now how can we do that? 
Did you ever notice that there's really no other nation described in the Bible? Where is another nation supposed to find their destiny? It's not in there. What has to happen is there's only one pattern nation and it's Israel. And so what you have to do is take God's pattern destiny on Israel and then take it and take the DNA of that and give it to the different nations of the world so that they can come into their national destiny. So that God can say to Indonesia, as I did to Israel, I will do with you. In fact, it even says in Romans 9, to the Palestinians, as I did to Israel, I will do with you. Yeah, but don't, don't, don't read it now, but you'll see it. <laughs> and it says to the Ethiopians, you do that. And so we take the God's destiny on the nation of Israel, and we want to bring it to the nations of the world. Canada, the way God blessed Israel, wants to bless you. You'll be different in how it works out, but you take the pattern of Israel, and then you will come into your own destiny. And we bless other nations. But it can only come from because this is the only nation in the Bible. So we have to take that pattern and bring it to the, na to the rest of the nation. And say, here's the general pattern in our nation. Now you take it in your nation and you put your character, your culture, your personality, your giftings, your calling. You fill it up with your color and your music and your language and you fill it up. But there's only one pattern and it's the pattern of Israel. So if we don't take the pattern from Israel to the rest of the nations, how can they come into a place of destiny? Isn't it amazing? God said to Abraham, through you and through the people that will come out of you, all of the rest of the nations of the world will be blessed. But we've got to have a change of heart to want to bless the nations. That's not hard to understand, is it? But it's hard to do. There's a popular bumper sticker in Israel. And it says this, Yehudim Ohavim Yehudim. It says, Jews love Jews. Now it's supposed to mean something positive. It's supposed to mean that the center of faith of Jew, as, as in Judaism is love, and those, therefore we love one another. That's the good part. On the other part, can you imagine how blind and how racist that is? Imagine that it said, Arabs love Arabs. Muslims love Muslims. Christians love Christians. Black people love black people. What, what would we, how would you react to that? You racist, how could you say something like that? But we Jewish people, we're the chosen people. So we think, I'm saying, there is a, there is an ethno, help me with this, ethnocentricity on ourselves that is so embarrassing. And it's so bad that the only people that don't see it is us. <laughs> and all of the rest of the nation see it. And I've seen this in so many conferences with people. We come up and we, we're willing to come and repent for who we, not just our own sins, but for the sins of our people. And you know what the reaction says? People are like, wow, I've never seen Jewish people repent. That's a fascinating, fascinating phenomenon. <laughs> Hilarious, isn't it? Not really. But you ask yourself, what's been our message over the past 40 years? We go all around the world to tell everybody else how special we are. That's disgusting. When we are supposed to come and be a source of blessing to others. And that's what we want to do. We come, but it's, so it takes, it's not hard to understand, but it takes a change of heart. Do we want to love Indonesians? Do we want to love Ethiopians? Do we want to love Russians? Do we want to love Arabs? Do we want to love the different peoples of the world? Can we expand our hearts that we want to love the peoples of the world? If we will do that, then God is waiting to bestow an authority, on, on a historic transition of authority if we will be willing to bless and to love. Hallelujah. So we need to get healed and be willing to submit to the Lordship of Yeshua in our own lives and be willing to uh, bless others. And so God can bring us in the place that He wants. Let me, let me take a pause for a moment and
and talk a little bit about what's this transition that I was mentioning that's happening in our congregations. You know, one of the things that Dan taught us back in the, in the early 80s that we believe that God was restoring His kingdom upon the earth. Not only was He restoring the Jewish roots of the faith, but He was also restoring such things as the fivefold ministry. So we, we believe in restoration. The word tikkun means restoration. So essentially we believe in restoration. Just as we believe in the restoration of the Jewish roots of the faith, we also believe in the restoration of apostolic and prophetic ministry. Do you see that? If it's, the, it's the same principle. Just of, That's why we believe in physical healing. That's why we believe in financial prosperity. We believe in God's restoration in every area of life. And that includes apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Amen. So what happened was in the early 1980s, we began to get connected with maybe four or five different uh, New Covenant, New Testament type streams of apostles and prophets. And they would come in and teach us, and we would get blessed. And they began to we began to understand what was happening then. And then, and what happened was those different streams began to invite us. Well, why don't you just join in with us? And so we began to pray. So that was the first stage. I want to describe to you five stages of apostolic development for us. The first stage was we were relating to these different Christian apostolic networks. Are you listening to me? So then they were asking us to join them. We said, what should we do? So in 1984, we all went out and we just began to pray and fast and seek the Lord and say, God, what do you want us to do? And at that time, we felt the Lord was speaking to us and say, no, don't join them. Start a Messianic Jewish fivefold apostolic prophetic type ministry. That was in 1984. We prayed for about a year. We finally got started in about 1985. And God began to bring people together for that vision. We finally, when we finally released it after that, we finally got into a five-fold leadership. And that first group was with Dan leading it, myself, Aton, Michael Brown, and Paul Wilbur, going all the way back to, I think, maybe 86. And when we did that, if we had the sense that there was a historic transition of the faith that we had moved and not only seeing fivefold restoration but moving fivefold restoration and messianic Judaism together. Can you feel the excitement of that? That's that's thirty years ago. Yes. Amen. Well hallelujah. All hell broke out within, within about a month of it. As somebody says new levels, new devils. <laughs> And so we were, what we were, in the one hand, we were glory, and God was doing this incredible, revelatory, historic development, in the, and we knew it was true, and we were getting the crap kicked out of us during this time because the devil was beating us up all over the place. Excuse my theology. But uh, I, wanted, I want you to say, but it was going to happen. Man, and we just got kicked around, but thank God we survived. And by the grace of God, things began to multiply all over the place. We, I'm sure there must have been some mistake we didn't make, but I couldn't think of one right now. <laughs> but God blessed it anyway. It was amazing. And you know, the congregation began to multiply and grow, and we, you know, it was like, wow, what's happening here? So then we came to the third stage. We began to pray, and we said, listen, we, we believe God wants to now transfer this and establish it in Israel. It won't just be fivefold, it'll be messianic fivefold, not just messianic fivefold, but Israeli messianic fivefold. And that happened in 91, 92, in 92 when I went over, and then Eitan went over, and then a few years after that, then Eitan began to start a Ohre Rachamim, the Tents of Mercy, and it began to grow. He started with one home group, and it began to grow and then multiply several home groups of congregation, another congregation, another congregation, and now it's growing and then it became, it actually became in a certain extent a first five-fold uh, mini little network there in Israel. And it had be, been broken through it. Thank God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, after a few years after that, then we finally felt that we were supposed to start. That was always the plan that we would have three networks, one in America, one in northern Israel, and one in the Jerusalem Tel Aviv quarter. So finally we felt that we were ready. And uh, so we just started in 2004. 
We said, okay, God wants us to be able to, to start a, a, uh, another team in the Jerusalem area. And as Eitan, with his pastoring skills, started it with a home group and loving people and bringing, you know, that's Eitan. So we started, we said, but the people that started gathering around me, we started praying and prophesying and, and that, that's what we do. You know, it's just different, different ways you come into it. So, uh, and we started a little group, you know, I said, well, listen, I brought that group and I said, let's, let's believe to be like Yeshua and the 12. So we gathered around 12 young Israelis around us. We began to worship every day and receive prophetic revelation and teach and share and build covenant together. And then out of that came Revive Israel and then the prayer center and the evangelistic center. And then we, and then started the congregation in Jerusalem and then in Tel Aviv. And then all of a sudden, boom, we, you know, all of a sudden God had built this, this was the next stage of, this was the fourth stage where it wasn't just an Israeli messianic fivefold, now it was a Jerusalem centered fivefold ministry. And new level, new levels, new devils, man. She it's like we grabbed a snake by the wrong side, you know, and it didn't work out like Moses where it turned into a stick. We got bit up a lot, you know. But when that, when that happened, then a whole bunch of other things started to change. It was like, all of a sudden, when you get to Jerusalem, you know, it's kind of like that's the last stop. You know what I mean? And when we were there, all of a sudden, things started, we felt this shifting going on in the body around the world. And we were barely surviving. We were just holding on with our fingernails, try, trying to get through this from day to day. And... Um, and then people, some people began to hear about that. They said, what? There's an apostolic prophetic team coming out of Jerusalem? And people began to say, well, we want you to bless us. In fact, we want to be aligned to you. In fact, we want to be submitted to you. In fact, we want to be in the, We were going, help, what's happening? Everybody started turning around and we couldn't. It was, it was like out of control. I'll give you a few examples. There was a few years ago, it, uh, the last time we were at the, the, the large Kansas City uh, Israel mandate, and I got up there, and, and I, I prayed, the Lord gave me a message to, to bless the church. So I got up there at, at the Israel mandate at, at IHOP, and I gave a message on the glory of the International Ecclesia, the glory of the International Church. So our friends are going, Asher, what are you doing? You know, hey, talk about Messianic Judaism. I said, I don't know, that's the message God gave me. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Pickle got right up after that and he said, here's my message. And I call it the PAL message, P-A-L. And he said, in the end times, the Messianic Jews are going to take primary apostolic leadership of the body of Christ. Amen. I said, that my pen fell out of my hand when I was, I said, I went to Mike, I said, did you hear what you said? <laughs> Do you believe it? He says, yeah, you know what? Yeah, I believe it. So, and, and so, uh, what? And then I told you that story, how then we, went, we met with all the leaders of, of a Glow International. And they said, oh, there's a five-fold ministry coming out of Jerusalem. We've been waiting for this. We want to submit to them. We're going to submit to this. We're, we're barely surviving here. You know, there's nothing. We don't have anything to submit to. They said, we don't care. <laughs> And they said, look, it's not about you. It's about us getting lined up with, with Yeshua's second coming and his kingdom. We don't really, I mean, you're just a pawn in this situation. We want to get lined up with his kingdom coming. And then I told you the story that happened with the Chinese. The Chinese story is amazing, and I, I can't go through the whole thing. But I want to tell you something. A hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, the early Chinese believers, pioneers that were persecuted and killed, they had a vision, a revelation from God that God was going to bring a revival to China and they were going to bring the gospel back across Asia and bring it back to Jerusalem and, and, and bring it to pass and, and bring the kingdom of God to come to pass. It. And they've been believing this for decades and decades. And the people that started this, the original movement of that, all those people basically died out and they, they thought it's not going to work. Have you ever heard this story? They marched across China. They marched across China to Western China to cross over, to bring the gospel. And then, and then Mao came into power, closed the gates, 
persecuted them, killed all the Christians. They were left there in this little tiny community on the western side of China. They never got out of the country. And now killed all the Christians, burned all the Bibles in the country. Nothing happened. And they thought that was the end of it. They, they were, I mean, they were marked. They were going on foot to come back to Jerusalem. And then 1979, boom, 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 started to be miracles. When Mao went out of power, there was the, 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 the new prime minister of, of China, and he loosened up just a little bit, not that much, and now miracles began to happen. People began to get healed. They didn't even have Bibles. They would copy the Bibles by hand, begin to pass them out, and move from one home group to another home group to another home group. Then it just, like popcorn all over the country, getting thrown in jail, getting killed, but multiplying. And they, you know, they, you know the story, they went up to 90 million people through this. And all of those people, these poor, ignorant peasants in the countryside of, of China that were getting persecuted and thrown in jail. And you've heard the stories, their discipleship program was to go to the third floor and jump out of the window so they would know what to do when the secret police came to arrest them. And all of them got a revelation that God was bringing a revival to China so that they could bring it across Asia and bring it back to Jerusalem to bring about the second coming of Asia. And, these, and, and, and they found out, they found out about that original community in Western China and they went there and they found them and, and they said, and were, the old people, just, just a few left. And they said, hey, you, you don't know what's happened. You don't know what's happened. They said, 90 million people have come to faith. They said, were you kidding? They said, not only that, we've all got the vision that you had um, decades ago and now we're ready to bring this back to you. And all of the people just cried and said, we can't even believe it. And then we saw these representatives, the fathers of the Chinese, coming up to Jerusalem to, to, to meet us and say, hey, we've come, we've come to you, we've come to present the kingdom of God to you, that for you to come and take leadership of this, we're going to bring it back from China here, and we want you, and then we're expecting you guys to, to lead us in, to bring the kingdom of God to them. <laughs> what? And this was all, all five of the fathers of, of the underground Chinese church, they all received it. And they came in. And then we saw this happening from people coming to coming up to Jerusalem, from, from South America, from Europe, from all around the world, saying, saying, we've come here because God has revealed it to us that in order to bless our nation, we need to come here and submit and get a blessing coming out of Jerusalem so that God will bring a revival to our nation. You know, and we're sitting there with 10 people, 15 people. We, okay, you know, we'll bless you. Thank you, hallelujah. Yeah, we just hallelujah. Amen. They go, okay. <laughs> now, we can't figure it out. This is changing all around. Then I also told you the story. I'm just making sure because some of you might have heard this. And then just this past year, you know, I said, well, we've been having this, this tension between the Arab believers and the, and the Jewish believers. It was getting very tense. And when the Chinese came, they brought us together to prayer. And then we just said, listen, we're going to start praying and worshiping. And God's going to bring a solution here. Man, when all those Chinese pray, I mean, there's nothing you can do but just, you know, it's going to happen. <laughs> so we're just there praying, praying for days. We got the, we got the Jewish believers and the Arab believers together. And the Chinese are worshiping. And, we're, okay. and then all of a sudden, the Spirit of God starts to fall. And one of the... One of the Arab pastors gets up and he says, uh, he says, well, look, I can't even believe this, but the Spirit of the Lord is dealing with me that we have to be married to the Jewish people. And then he said, not only married to it, and he was shaking. I mean, he couldn't get the words out. And he said, not only that, he said, we need to understand that in this relationship, it's the Jewish people that have part of the husband. And we have to come and be, not only be married to them, but come and submit to him. And he's weeping and the Holy Spirit's falling. And he's saying this. I'm standing there and he's, you know, talking to us, but he's talking to me there. And I, and I go up and I give him a hug and we just, and people are weeping and crying. The Holy Spirit's falling. And there's a whole bunch more of that story, but I, I just want to touch that one part. And see, and I, I begin to realize at this time, listen to this. If we say that God has given a special, renewed apostolic authority on the Messianic Jews in Israel, nobody will believe it. <laughs> and not only that, it's self-centered. And you know what I realized is he was hugging me, 
tearing, snot running all over her shoe. You know how that is, you know, one of those Holy Spirit moments. And, uh, you know, and all of a sudden I realized there's only one group of people that can say that and nobody else can say no. And it's not the Chinese, it's not the Americans. But when the Arab believers say, we have received a revelation that the Jewish brothers have to become the older brother and begin to lead the body, who's gonna say no? And when they began to do that, and I wanna tell you, there's been a big fight on that. And right after the, there's been splits in the body, there, there's, there's tensions of that, but, but we see this coming. I'm talking about this shift in what's going on in, in the kingdom of God. You see this in the, in the spiritual battle that's going on with this. Now all that happened, so that was like the fourth stage. And I wanna come in and I wanna talk about the fifth stage. And here's, uh, the purpose of this message is to ask you, do we want to do this fifth stage together? And here's how it started. About four or five years ago, Dan and I started having some really difficult arguments. I mean, really difficult arguments. By Dan, really difficult. And not for a day, and not for a week, and not for a month, and not for a year. I mean, it was hell. Every single one of our congregations, conversations, boom, boom, boom. It was just, it was terrible. And we prayed and we fought and we came and said, what is going on, you know? And we were, I mean, we hit a lot of you and said, listen, let's just quit. Let's just, you know, it's over. But we have this great theology and that is that we're stuck. <laughs> I tried so hard to get out of this, but I'm just stuck, you know, you can't get out of it. But anyway, so we said, okay, listen, let's just pray. God, what do you want us to do? And in prayer, we felt the Lord was saying, there's a next stage after Jerusalem, what that is. And then that out of that Jerusalem group that we could begin to pull together our various streams and then not just have a Jerusalem group, but a combined international family of networks coming out of Jerusalem. And I'm telling you, there has been such a fight on this thing. And this is the shift. That's why Dan's moving to Israel. That's why Ben's moving over to Israel. That's why, because we feel that God is pulling together Tikkun and Al Haleh and Revive and wants to, and gateways and bringing us, bringing us back together to, to bring us together as a, not just as a team, but as a family of teams to come back together and unite around a Jerusalem-centered base and say, God, if we will do that, it will just get everything lined up in the right way and maybe it would just release a blessing from God. Are you hearing me? Yes. And so this is what it's all about. And we're saying, hey, do we really want to do this? I'm a little scared to tell you the truth. More than a little. I mean, dear God, I'm, I'm barely getting through from day to day as it is right now. I mean, it would, I don't want to go to another level. I don't want any more devils. <laughs> but you know how it is with God. You don't have that choice. It's just not my will, but your will be done. And what we're saying to you is after three years of prayer and devotion, a lot of arguments, that we believe that this is, this is something that God wants to do, is to, is to bring these gateways and tikkun and, and revive and ohale and, and other brothers and sisters that will be connected with us from different streams and begin to unite us together as a family of networks coming out of Jerusalem that will be able to, to bring an alignment for the kingdom of God. So the question is, listen guys, this is a new paradigm for me, for Dan, and it is for you. So I'm here just to try to tell you that, folks, this is what's brewing. This is the shift that we say, that we think is happening from the Lord. And so we want to just be out front with this and say, guys, are, we, are you in this with us? Do we want to do this together? Don't say yes, yes, yes. I mean, but another 10 minutes, we'll get to this. 10 more minutes. <laughs> So I'm saying we feel this is this is what's happening. And we've been to things have been, have been happening so fast. And it's connected with this. I want to come back to this thing of honoring authority one more time and then and then we'll pray. So one of the things we began to see was our covenantal relationships that what we talked about on Thursday. Just love one another, be faithful, and God will set up the alignment. The other thing is to is to honor God's authority. 
and then let God begin to position things. So I'll give you an example. So we're with our team at Revive Israel, and we're praying one day, and we're just getting us, wait a minute, you know, we really believe that Ariya Bar David is an, is an apostolic father in the land of Israel. And we said, you know what, we need to honor this guy. So we called him in, we asked him to teach us, we honored him, gave him a blessing, did all kinds of things with this, and, and gave him a gift and everything, and, we, and, and it was, and he said, well, what are you doing? I said, listen, I don't know, we just, we want to get in right line. We want to submit, we want to honor who you are and receive that. And something just began to open up in the spirit. And we moved into a partnership between Revive Israel and, and Yad Shmona and began to build this new neighborhood that's coming up in Yad Shmona. It's, it's, become, it's going to become the first, really the only messianic kibbutz in the world. It's going to be a city on a hill. And, and it's all just because we just took one day to humble ourselves and come before him and say, we recognize the calling upon your life and we honor you and receive them. That opened up the hearts of everybody there and they received us and we received them. We came into a partnership and this thing has been birthed. And then we went and we took the, some of our other friends and we went to Ari Sokolan. And I said, look, Ari, we want to honor you. We see you as one of the, the fathers here in the land. We begin to, we begin to honor him with, it, with no other plan. That was it. You know, his response was, hey, do you want to take the congregation that I planted here? I want to turn it over to you. And see, things like this begin to happen. You see, when you, when you begin to honor authority, it brings you into a right alignment for God to release the blessing. And it doesn't matter how the person acts, good or bad, that's not the point. You want to get in a right alignment so that God can release the blessing on you. In some ways, it's totally selfish. It's just that to get there, you've got to be really humble to get to that point. You know, I'm not going to trick you that, you know. So, but, but it's so, well, we began to watch this happen. Here's another thing that happened, just to be a little honest with you. In one of these sessions where we were having an argument, here's how bad it got. We were sitting there, Dan was there, Eitan and me, and David Rudolph. We're sitting there. And uh, I wasn't exactly in the spirit. <laughs> and I said to David, hey, why are you even here? Why should you even be in this group? I mean, you're over 70. I don't even I don't understand. You know, you've already turned stuff over at gateways to your kids. Why should we have been in this group? Spiritual guy that I am. <laughs> so then I said, no, no, but re honestly, I said, I want to tell you something. How did it work with you and your gateways team? They've got five, uh, five campuses around the world, just fantastic disciples. And he said, he said, Asher, here's what happened. He said, I turned the authority over to each one of the campus leaders. And he said, now I don't have any authority with them. I just have influence because they honor my influence as having been the father, but I've released all the authority. And I said, David, that's what I wanted to hear. Now I understand. That's the pattern that we're going to go for. And that's what I want to go for. And that's what Dan wants to go. We want to move into the place where we're going to give away all the authority. And we're going to come into the place where we don't even have authority. We're just going to be respected fathers and grandfathers where, where it has influence of the younger people listening to our advice. Where they're taking it out and they have the authority. And that's where we're moving. I said, oh, that lines up. Thank you, David. Stay. Hallelujah. <laughs> And that began up to open up, and I, went, I started going to artists. I said, guys, here's where we're going. I want to work myself out of a job here. I want to give everything to you, and all I want at the end, I just want to have, have a place of respect where you listen to what I have to say. That's all. You don't have to do it. Just listen to it. That's all. And you can begin to see this transfer going on. It's so beautiful. And then what happened when they came over, this was just two months ago. They came over and we had, we had Matthew, David's older son, came and we're all praying together and all of a sudden we got a revelation that this was, that he had just stepped into an apostolic anointing and authority and we all laid hands upon him. It was a prophetic moment. The Holy Spirit fell. We laid hands upon him and, 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 and uh, uh, anointed and appointed him as the first of the second generation apostles. The first time it ever happened, we said, this is a paradigm breakthrough for us. 
See, David is moving out of authority, coming to a place of respect, and his firstborn son is stepping in as the network leader of those, and we're recognizing that. We said, we did it. We just got to a second generation of apostolic transfer in a, in a grandfather situation where we, where we've, where we have main the, maintained the tribe. Are you listening to me? Yeah. This is awesome. And things like this, I mean, I can tell you so many stories as God is, is realigning things quickly, bringing us into covenant, into alignment, into generational transfer, into a tribal sense of, of relationship with one another so that He can release His blessing. And I think that's probably all the examples that we have the time to, to go over tonight. But I just want to tell you that there is a, a blessing involved here. And, and, and we don't know exactly everything that's going to happen, of course. But this is the direction we feel God is leading us. And we just want to be honest with you. This is what we think God wants us to do. And do we want to be part of this together? You know? The reason that we're considering bringing the name of Tikkun in as the name that, that also reunites us. The reason we're doing that is for three. The name, the name Tikkun has three reasons. The first reason is because it was the first name that we had, so that it represents these 35 years of relationship. The second reason is according to Jewish tradition, as you have in the Aleinu prayer, it says, It says that we can restore the world and the kingdom of, of God Almighty, El Shaddai. It's a Jewish concept of Tikkun Olam. That when the Jewish people went to exile, it shattered the vessels and it broke over the world. And as God is regathering us, God is restoring the world. That's a Jewish mystical concept that we believe is, is also biblical. So that's one of the reasons. That's called tikkun in the Jewish rabbinic mystical world. And the third reason is, is in Acts 3.21. Where it says that God ultimately wants to bring about the restoration of all things. In the Hebrew New Covenant, that word there is tikkun. So it's those three reasons. Our historic relationships, and the Jewish concept of re restoration of the world, and the New Covenant concept of, of Acts 3.21, of bringing about the restoration of all things. And we're just asking, could it be? Could it be if we could get this alignment in our relationships, in our family, extended family together, if we could get this lined up, could it just be, maybe? Part of God aligning something to move a step forward toward the restoration of all things? Well, maybe, maybe not. You know, we can't, God's got to do that. We have to be willing to submit to His plan in humility and love. And this is the direction that we feel that we should go. Um, well, there's a lot more that I could say, but it's getting late. I want to, I want to stop here. Uh, last week, we had one of the dear families on our team, the Smilovich family, the, the young couple had a baby. And the baby came down and he was uh, akus. How do you say that? Yeah. Breach. And they went to the hospital and the doctor said, well, you know, we got to cut, we got to cut you open. And I said, no, no, we don't want to do that. And they took him to another kind of one of these uh, holistic doctors that did that and they said that for three days and they just prayed and then finally the baby just came out you know because you've got to get aligned up in the womb to get to be able to come out and, and I just believe that maybe God wants to burst something with us here burst something that could be a blessing beyond what we think but you see, it's going to require us to, to be healed of our own attitudes to our authority, to want to bless the nations of the world, and be willing to submit and come together in an alignment of a family of networks together. Is that what we want to do? And is God calling us to do that? And do we want to stand together? We want to come to you as leaders and we say, we think this is what God's saying. We've been praying about it a lot. But we've got to receive this as a family. Well, that's the message. Let's stand up and let's see if the Lord will say anything. Uh, Judah or Jen, if you're still here, it might be nice for us to have a little uh, worship in the back.